Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Well, really, national politics talk, specifically the 2014 midterm elections. A Republican rout, a stomp out, a beating, a much bigger Republican House, historically large, a GOP Senate, 31 governors, 69 state legislative houses. The 2016 elections, more favorable to Dems? Mmm. The 2016 lineups, a Dem other than Hillary, and which of a crowd of Republicans? Can Obama and Congress work together? On what issues, if any? Here to talk all this talk is Ed Rollins, one of the wisest of political wise men and by far my favorite political analyst. Welcome back, Ed. My pleasure. Thank you. You were here a month ago. Are you surprised? Bill Clinton was surprised. You were you were pretty pretty much on. I mean, you got eight out of eight out of the possible eight or eight out of nine. But are you surprised anyway? I, I was surprised that we that we did so well across the country. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, obviously, when I was on your show, I said we could pick up eight or nine. That was you know that was what I was hopeful as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, everything came through. Yeah, uh, but that was pretty solid analysis. Yeah, pretty going solid in. analysis. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to the governors. Uh, you know, we had we had a lot of governors. Uh, we only lost one. We lost uh, Tom Corbett in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. who basically never was able to get away from the Penn State yep. disaster. Uh, great, great guy, but obviously couldn't get away from that, and he raised taxes. Uh, and then the then the depth of the, the story that's really not been told is the depth in as it was in 210. We went really deep into state legislatures. We now have over 4,000 Republican state legislatures out of 7,000. We now control a vast majority of the chambers. Uh, uh, the 31 governors, obviously, and 32, if you want to count the Alaskan that's an independent who was a Republican uh, and probably will govern as a Republican, uh, that's unprecedented. And the Senate, in my lifetime, I have never, and I was, you know, through the Nixon, Reagan, Ford, Bush administrations, uh, we've never had this many senators. Uh, Reagan never had this many senators. We had 53 uh, when he got elected in, uh, in the landslide. And we've not had this many House members since 1928. So. I mean, so in, in some ways, this is a unique election. We're going way back into the last century to see a Republican dominance of the Congress since the 20s. What I always, and what I argue with my friends who are in the Congress and those who advise the Congress is we have been given the ball back again. Now we have to show we can run with it. Uh, it's, it's not a question of, uh, it's an opportunity. Uh, we have the combined Congress. We can now set an agenda. The president may not go along with the agenda. Uh, it'd be nice if he did, but if he doesn't go along with the agenda, at least there's going to be a presentation made to the American public. Here's what Republicans believe, and here's where we move forward. Divided government, obviously, is which we've had divided Congress, uh, hasn't worked very well, and divided government definitely doesn't work very well. But we're going to at least for the next two years have a president who can either play or not play. If he doesn't play, then obviously Republicans have to put forth a, an agenda that can sell to the country. You speak of Republicans as if they're a monolith, but clearly they're not. I mean, you know, Boehner's leadership, the, the, the evangelicals, which we'll get to when we talk about 2016. So the Republic, is there a unified Republican party? Is there a unified Republican, or can there be a unified Republican agenda? I, I would say that we're, we're closer to, we don't, we don't have what we used to have when I first came to Washington in 1972. Uh, we don't have the Northeast liberals, uh, Republicans. We don't have the moderates. Uh, so there's not. When, mm -hmm. when we had, uh, during the Reagan administration, when I was the political director, we had a majority. We had 53 senators. But Bob Byrd, uh, who was the minority leader, always could get six or seven moderate mm -hmm. uh, to, to more liberal uh, Republicans to, to vote with him. So we were always negotiating with our own side. I think at this point in time, McConnell will basically have on most votes, 51, 52, maybe even more. There's several, four or five Democrats who are a little more conservative. Uh, the House, obviously, Boehner has a big, big margin there. And uh, But he's got problems, too. And he's you know, had he's, problems he's, in he's, his list. Know, it's, it's part of the problems were the, were the Tea Party that came in initially, and, 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 and John Boehner, who's a, who's a dear friend of mine, actually I was the chairman of the Congressional Committee when he got elected in 1990. Boehner was not the revolutionary leader that Gingrich had. When Gingrich... Right. 
uh, won in 1994, he had been the leader of that of that coalition. Right. Boehner was never the leader. Boehner was was a was more of an establishment Republican. Uh, he has, I think, done an effective job of balancing all the sides. He's he, he's well liked. Uh, there's no there's no rump groups out there trying to dump him at this point in time. So my sense is he's he and McConnell are going to have an opportunity to put forth in the next two years an agenda. Uh, I hope we get back to running the Congress the way we're supposed to run the Congress. You're supposed to have committee hearings. You're supposed to have budget appropriation hearings. Move move things through the Congress through the committees, uh, and not basically have gangs of eight going off and, and drafting bills. Uh, uh, you know you basically will have a have a, a system that works better. We've not had a budget in a long long time. It's very very important in this time of fiscal crisis that we have um, some some continuity to the business community to the to the outside world uh, what can we how, where's the certainty uh, and there's a lot of big issues that need to be tackled what 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 is the Republican agenda if we can put quotes around uh, the I, 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 I think Republicans don't want to spend more money they feel the government spends too much money at this point in time we're spending money we don't have every cycle whether it's half a trillion or a trillion dollars which will go back to I'm sure in the very near future the trillion dollar deficits uh, they think there's too many programs they think some of those programs need to be revised as sort of some still the priorities of FDR and Lyndon Johnson uh, Obviously, you need some reform of the entitlements. Uh, not easy to do, but we need some reform of the entitlements. Those are the, those are the runaways. And, 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 you, and you need tax reform. You and, definitely need tax reform. And, and, you, and you need perhaps more revenue out of this tax well, you, reform. I, I don't argue that you, we need more revenue. Whether you get more revenue by raising taxes on the rich, which would be what the president would do, which you've already done, or whether you basically try and create an environment that creates more revenue by more people working, which is what we would advocate. You know, I think the key the key thing here is to basically keep your eye on the ball and don't think that the government has an open open checkbook uh, with unlimited uh, uh, loan capacity. Uh, so I, I think I think it's just uh, you know it's it's a big challenge. It's a bigger challenge with the president obviously being of the other party. Does he want to cooperate? Is his legacy going to be that he basically does everything he can to to defer Republicans, or does he basically try to work with them? Immigration. Immigration is something that needs to be tackled. Uh, we have 14 million. Illegals in the country. I was very involved in the '86 bill, right? Uh, and and the and the dynamics of '86 were quite different. Uh, it was mainly a California problem. It wasn't it wasn't a national problem. We had a, we had about five million, four to five million illegals in the country. Most of them were in California. Uh, there were about six or seven states: New York, Illinois, New Jersey. It wasn't a nationwide. Right now, it's a nationwide. Uh, sure. And and you basically can't. You know, it's absurd to think you can take 14 million people and either keep them undercover or, or, or move them out of the country. It can't happen. But at the same time, you have to have an orderly process. And the orderly process, and I've always felt that we, we, we absorb about a million legals, illegals a year. We make them American citizens. That number, we're now 330 million people. There's no reason we couldn't expand that number. There's no reason we couldn't make it 5 million or 10 million people a year. We can absorb that many people. Then you can basically do the things that you need to do. You can have the, you can have the farm workers. You can have the, the, the intellectual people who come here to basically study at Harvard and MIT and, and great universities like your university and, and, and don't necessarily want to go back. They, right. They've got the skills, but today they have to go back to the countries of origin. So my, my sense is it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to be looked at. The failure of the 86 bill... Uh, was that it was not just a question of, of an amnesty, it was a question of um, employer sanctions. The employers were supposed to guarantee that, that once we did this, we wouldn't mm -hmm. do it again. Uh, and obviously, it never happened. Never happened. Uh, we need to make sure our borders are secure uh, based on, the, on the, the, the threats of terrorism and what have you. And it's not just, uh, we need to know who's here and why they're here. And, and, and it needs, again, be a land of opportunity. We're a nation of immigrants. Immigrants have always contributed greatly to this country. I think that my fear is the president uh, this week or, or very near future is going to basically put a blanket amnesty program out there. And it's not really, he's not, he cannot give people citizenship. All he can do, only the Congress can do that. All that he can do is basically say to the Department of Health and uh, Homeland Security, which is where Customs and Enforcement is, uh, don't deport anybody. Uh, uh, don't deport these three right. or four or whatever it may be. It's not giving them a path to free. It's, it's, it's basically saying it's okay to stay here. You came in here illegally. You get to stay here as long as the executive order stays in place, which is only three Could years. only be two years. Could only be two years. Two years. So, so at the end of the day, um, and, and I think if he does it this way, uh, it, it, it obviously will, will defer the Republicans in the Congress from trying to do a long term. With the assumption that there, there is both the, uh, the will to get to the first of your points, and that is 
expand the opportunities for illegals to become legal without sending them back home. You can't, if that's not there, you can't, then... You can't, you can't send them back home. I, what you're going to do if you basically say that four or five million can stay here and not be deported, that means that another five or six million are still, still, still there. can be deported. And so you're, you're creating a, a class among the, among the, the illegals, which is a class warfare, which is not fair. I, I think the key thing here... And the, and the problem that no one wants to explain, the Senate bill was passed and had 14 Republicans vote for it. Uh, it most of them did not think it was going to go, thought it was going to go to the House. It was, it, was a, it was a one House bill. Right. And so we don't live on a unicameral. We basically have two houses of Congress. Uh, and so, you know, so the, for the president to say, take it or leave it, is not, is not, not the fair, not amiable. I mean, this was, a, this was a John McCain, Chuck Schumer bill that they put together. And, and at the end of the day, we need to, we need to look long and hard make sure the borders are secure, make sure that people who come here are safe, make sure that there is the need for this kind of workload. I mean, you just don't need uh, uh, more and more people to come to the country illegally that can't find work or, or basically become a burden on states. Uh, lots of us look out at the, at the next two years and see not compromise and, and agreement, but virtual deadlock. Forget about gridlock, deadlock. The issue, I, I, would, I would not argue against that. I'm very hopeful uh, that there, there will be at least a, a, a coordination in the Congress and they can put things forward. Uh, I don't think the president basically is going to sit down and say, this is what I want, and, and either Boehner or McConnell saying, this is what we want. And that would be a good thing. That'd be a positive mm -hmm. thing. Uh, there, are, there are four big areas we need to deal with as a, as a country. Uh, one is we definitely need immigration reform. Uh, second, we need tax reform. We have the highest taxes, corporate taxes in the world. Uh, uh, companies are merging with other companies in other countries so they, they don't have to create jobs. We have to do something to basically stimulate this economy. And the well, we, if I may be a little contrarian, we also don't we have to make corporations pay taxes instead of paying zero taxes well, when I'm paying the, the, and you're paying a hell of a lot more? The, va the vast majority, the, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world and the vast majority of, of corporations do pay it. Where we really get clobbered is small business is taxed as individuals. They're not taxed as, 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 as corporations. Mm -hmm. And so a small business can be paying 39% yep. uh, uh, or 50 or 60% when you put the state, state and city burdens on them. Um, and that's, that puts companies out of business. Okay. So somehow we have to basically re-examine. The, the problem is Dave Camp, who's been the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, has spent the last four years, uh, he's now leaving Congress in, in, uh, in January, probably be succeeded by Paul Ryan, uh, who was the budget chairman. Uh, the, the problem is he, no one studied the tax issue more extensively than he did. He's had thousands of hearings. He's bought every tax expert in the world. And they've sort of blown apart all the, all the little gimmicky type things, flat tax, 10, 10, 10, all the stuff that you hear in the course of the campaign. And, and really to have the, a minimum the same revenue you have today uh, and maybe even, maybe even add more revenue, uh, it's complicated because somebody always gets stuck. And the people who usually get stuck, the financial community in some way, shape, or form, so they have the strongest lobbying. So the moment that they right. came out with this plan, right. a very comprehensive plan, it was dead on arrival. Couldn't get a vote in the, in the House. I think they've got to work. And again, I would say take two years, figure this out, do as effective a job as possible, and get something that's workable and something that's long-lasting. Okay, let's, let's, let's do a little post-mortem on 2014. It seems that Tip O'Neill was wrong or mostly wrong in this election that all politics was local. I mean, clearly, Obama hung over this campaign nationally. Democrats try to localize it. Grimes do doesn't even admit that she voted or didn't vote for, for the president. Obama too much of an albatross? He was a big albatross. Uh, the, 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 actually, the, the, the two elections we've won, 210, the, the congressional midterm elections, Nancy Pelosi was the target in 2010. Right. Uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars were spent demonizing her, justifiably or not. Uh, and in this particular case, we didn't have to demonize the president because he already had record lows. I mean, if you took away the support of the African-American support, which is like 80, 90 percent approval rating of the president, and it's certainly their right to, to be there because they're obviously proud of him and, and may agree with his policies, he'd be down to 25 percent. He'd be the lowest approval ratings ever. I mean, he's down among the lowest now at 40 percent below. Uh, so among the white voters, and you have to remember, this is an election which 75 percent of the electorate were white voters. 
Well, that was a major change from 2012 and 2008. Different electorates. Sixty percent, sixty percent of those white voters voted for Republicans. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, the voters that turned out, and, and there's always a big drop off. There's always a 40, 50 million vote drop off in the midterms because it just isn't the interest. This was a record low. When they finished counting all these places, it's going to be a record low. It's going to be a 70-year, 80-year, probably, probably historic low. Uh, irony, more money, ironically, more money was spent in this race, yep. turning people off, I think, than anything else. Talk, ab talk about the, the massive infusion of money, nearly $4 billion, and it made, it's made this, this election cycle really mean. There's no, there's, no, there's no serious race in this country. It used to always be, and I, I ran the Congressional Committee, and just being the White House political director, there was always a struggle as to who were your priorities. You couldn't fund all the races. Right, you couldn't, right. And even, even your good challenger races, you didn't have sufficient funds. That's no longer the case. There's now more money than, than either side ever needs to take the serious races and make them, make them viable. Uh, the problem is you now have independent expenditures that are in there that basically are uncoordinated, uh, meaning that if someone wanted was your friend and wanted to go out and give $10 million to your congressional campaign, you can't have any coordination. Your campaign manager can't talk to them. And they can talk about any issue they want to. So you take a campaign like Joni Ernst, who just won the Iowa race. She had issues she wanted to talk about. There was more money being spent on this by different groups, uh, basically driving messages. And no one knows who's what. They all, it all blends in. So you think it's all one campaign. And to a certain extent, as a strategist, uh, losing that ability to control your own campaign is, is a serious long-term problem. But I think at the end of the day, the more money that was spent, and we've seen it now in the last couple of elections, and it's only going to increase. I mean, we're going to have a 4 or $5 billion presidential race next time. Easy. Uh, easy. Uh, and if 95% of the advertising is negative, uh, you reach a point where you can't stand to see the commercials anymore. You can't break them through. If it's 24 hours a day, every 30 seconds there's a negative spot, and they counteract each other. There's a McConnell ad, there's, a, there's an opponent ad, back to back, back to back. Uh, you just get to a point you walk away from it. So it's, it's long-term destructive of, you know, the civic arena, if you will. Well, you have to find new ways to break through the messaging, and uh, the money is not going to be reduced. I mean, it's it, it works. It's got to be there. It's it's an arms race. It's an arms race, and and you know, public financing, which I, I told you the last time, I ran Reagan's campaign 30 years ago. Mondale and Reagan, when they became the nominee of their party, each got 40 million dollars from the federal government. 40 million four hundred thousand dollars. The Hagen race was 31 million dollars more so, than that. So for 40 million, you know, obviously 30 years ago, and maybe it would be double that if you right, had, right, right, if you fact that I ran a national, dollars. I ran a national campaign. There was no cable in those days. I ran a network. I ran 50 states. Uh, uh, and basically, you know, uh, you know, sp spent it all as as did the other side. But it was not like I was sitting there saying, "Oh, if I only had ten million dollars more, I could win. I could win forty nine states." Uh, sure. So my sense today is that public financing is not coming back, uh, uh, at least not in my lifetime. And I, it works for the incumbents, so they're going to continue to to want this thing. I don't think it's good for the process. I don't think it's good for America. What about limits in some way on this dark, on the independent expenditures and dark money, since it seems to be pernicious, as long, irrespective as long, of as long, source? As long as the court and the Supreme Court obviously has made a determination that, uh, that, that, that free speech is, is, is campaign spending uh, and that corporations and unions are, are people, are people right. uh, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not going to, I don't think you're going to back it off for a period of time. And I think at the end of the day here, People will figure out how to work the system. Now, what they can't figure out how to work yet is if you run 95% of your ads are negative, you're turning people off. I mean, we talked earlier about Governor Cuomo here in New York. Governor Cuomo spent $35 million against $2 million for his opponent. Uh, he won. He would have won if he had a yard sign and nothing else. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, he did nothing to enhance his own reputation. He did nothing at all to basically uh, t tell people how, what, what an effective governor he's been. He, all he did was trash his opponent. Uh, one of the most negative campaigns I've ever seen. But at the end of the day, is that, is that good for the system? Uh, you know, most people today you know, don't like politicians and they li like them less after campaigns because they basically uh, see each other getting trashed. I mean, and, and if you look at the political commercials in not only the nine or ten really hot states, right. they were full of, you know, lies, damn lies, statistics, sophistry. I mean, it was really, the, the level of the dialogue was really quite awful. 
it was awful, and 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 at the end of the day, it, it's it's uh, it doesn't doesn't benefit the process. Uh, so my my sense is, I, I don't know what's going to occur every time every time we have an election like this. There's all kinds of people, mainly academic types, who come forth and say we need to do something to change it. Uh, and unfortunately, they're not in positions to change it. Uh, uh, the people who are in, in positions to change it are those who benefit by the system. Sure. So they're not they're not going to they're not going to change. And it. that's where the money is going to come in, and that's why the dark money is going to remain dark. Well, dark with well, dark money, I, I, I'm I, I'm not advocating that we we basically limit the money. I, what I'm advocating is you got to have full transparency. Right, right. Yeah. At the minimum. At the minimum. At the minimum. Okay. So the old Democratic playbook of technology targeting and turnout didn't work in this particular election because it seems that the Republicans got smart and did technology turnout and targeting and had better candidates the, the, the better candidates was was a, was a key uh, it was it, you know it was a good it was a good cycle for us obviously these were the you know sort of the the, 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 the map was it was a good map for us uh, you know uh, the, the key, and it ain't that excuse me it ain't that great in 2016 the map it's 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 a tougher it's a tougher Senate environment uh, uh, and obviously presidential politics is built in advantages that the Democrats had I lived through the system where today they're they're there are uh, 242 electoral votes, 18 states have voted six straight times for Democrats, which gives them, you need 270, so you get 242 out of those 18. <laughs> How I did they lose? Well, I lived through an environment in which I, we had about 40 states. Uh, you know, we had, we had a lot of landslides. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's we true. We had six or seven elections uh, uh, in a period of time uh, that were, you know, were over 400 electoral votes. Right, so right. It, the dynamics change. The, 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 the hard part here is... When you look at the four big states, uh, New York and California, which gave the the the, 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 the first and second, uh, and I guess New York's going to be third pretty soon, but population-wise, it's tied with Florida. But very quickly, that's the margin. The five million vote margin in those two states was the president's margin, and the electoral uh, vote margin was the was the margin. So, so I think at the end of the day, you know, unless you compete in those states, which Republicans have chosen, for whatever reason, not to even advertise. Right, states. right. You don't, right. You don't make any contact. Right, and, and likewise, the South has become solidly Absolutely. Republican. That's not going to change. And that's not going to change. So let's go to 2016. Can Hillary be denied the nomination? Can, can she lose the nomination? Sure, she can lose the nomination. I don't think she will. Uh, and, and I think... A, I think, a I, big you know, question, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I don't think she's going to have a serious challenger. I think, I think this election has basically... Uh, made a lot of re Democrats sort of rethink, uh, you know, how do we how do we put this coalition, this magical coalition that Obama put together in two presidential elections? How do we energize those people again? And the only candidate that they see that can do that is Hillary, who can also add an intensity among women voters uh, as the first potential woman president. So my sense is there's going to be more pressure on her to, to run than ever before. You and I have talked about the dark horse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the color is there. Jerry, Jerry Brown is an unpredictable figure. And, and uh, I grew up with Jerry Brown in California. He's now just got elected to his fourth, fourth term in California, which is the longest in history in that state. Uh, he is in his 70s. Uh, he's a couple years older than Hillary. Uh, but he's, he's pretty dynamic. Just got yeah, overwhelming, very successful. overwhelming victory. Uh, he's had presidential ambitions before. He's had probably the most interesting political life of anybody, uh, having been governor at a very young age in California, uh, having been defeated for the U.S. Senate in uh, 1982, having gone off and been mayor of Oakland, the city in the state. Well, I ran against Carter. And, and, and ran against Carter in, in 76, won the last won, six primaries. Yep. Uh, uh, and basically, uh, so I think in the back of his head somewhere, uh, you know, he's, he's certainly not thinking of himself as an old man. He's thinking of himself as a... Okay, as so, a, as so, a, so we're going to remember so, this. So potential. Okay. The GOP. I mean... I, you could name a dozen. I could name a dozen possibilities. Obviously, they're different tiers. Just talk a little bit about what you see as a potential dynamic. Uh, there's, there's, there's two two wings of our party that are going to play out. Uh, we, we have some outstanding candidates this time. We've got at least four or five serious governors of states and maybe as many as ten. Every single governor just got reelected. He's got a staff around him saying, no reason you couldn't win. Uh, and, Walker, and, and, sure. You know, and, and, and at the end of the day, uh, there will be four or five serious candidates who try and put the race together. There's also three or four senators. You've got uh, Ted Cruz, who's definitely going to run. You've got Rand Paul, who's definitely going to run. Marco Rubio, if Jeb Bush doesn't run, certainly will run. Uh, and there may be another one out there that I'm not, that I'm not mentioning right now for no reason. Just So the two wings of the party, uh, 
the, the, the evangelical wing of the party is a very strong wing. And every place I go, whether it's a New York dinner party or on TV yesterday, someone says, to, you know, we've got to get to be a business party. We can't get rid of the no moral agenda, what have you. The problem with that is that it's a very significant vote factor. There's 25 percent of the national electorate uh, is, is self-identifies as evangelicals. Uh, 85 percent of that vote is Republican vote. That's a big, big, strong element. And they care about moral issues. They care about gay marriage and they care about abortion. They care about things like that. When you get to those early states like Iowa and South Carolina, the numbers go up to 38 yep. percent in Iowa, 40 percent in yep. South Carolina. And I think any candidate who wants to be serious because of the craziness of our primary process, uh, anybody who's not a big establishment figure, and the establishment figures are Romney and Bush and what have you, who, who can put money and organization together in a heartbeat, everybody else has to go through Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, uh, Nevada, which is a much smaller segment, but it's, it's one of the first four. Uh, I think you gotta win two out of those first three. Uh, if you're a Christie, you gotta win two out of those first three. And if you don't win those first first races, uh, it gets very hard to be viewed as a viable Okay, candidate. so we got a minute. Suppose if you're Mike Huckabee. Mike Huckabee obviously runs as the evangelical candidate and he has to he has to beat someone like Ted Cruz, uh, uh, the, the, the outstanding doctor from, uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins who's in the race. Uh, uh, there'll be, uh, there's several others, uh, Walker, uh, uh, the governor of Indiana, uh, Mike, Pence. Mike Pence, who's also, you know, they all kind of tap into that evangelical. But I think the evangelicals have made a determination that they're tired of being the backbone of the party and losing to the establishment candidate in the end. So, okay, who's the establishment candidate? I would say the establishment candidates are Christie, uh, obviously Jeb Bush if he, if he runs, uh, uh, and then, then the governors. Could be Kasich, could be, uh, could be Walker, Walker. Could be Walker, one of those. Okay, but we'll have to end, but Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton, is this moving forward or is this moving backward? Well, it depends. You got it depends, 20 seconds. depends on Jeb Bush. If Jeb Bush wants to run, I think he's a very credible candidate. He's not a lock. It's not a, he's got to go win this sure. thing. And, and, uh, uh, but, it, but I think if the two of them run, they respect each other's families. I think it would be a much higher plane. There's a lot of Democrats who would basically be supportive of, of a Jeb Bush candidacy that don't like Clinton. Not a lot, but I mean some. Uh, but, but I think it would be a very credible campaign. My thanks to Ed Rollins for being on the show. Join me next week when my guest will be Ian Vanderwalker of the NYU Brennan Center for Justice to talk about dark money here on CUNY TV. I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.